Hi, Chris. Hi, Tony. How are you? Good, thanks. And hi, everyone else. Um, we've, we're on our last webinar now of our five webinars, so it's great to see lots of people still on the line um, and logging in to see what we're talking about today, um, which is using the data. So a, a couple of quick housekeeping things. As always, um, this is the webinar, so we're going to be recording it. Please put yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Um, and put that gallery view on up on the right hand corner if you want to see people's faces. Please feel free to put questions in the chat function as we go. Um, we'll try and answer them. Happily, both of us are in the same city today, so um, we can, one of us can do the questions and one can do the talking and we'll bounce around a bit. So um, it's great to have two Arkina people in the one camera today. So the agenda for the day, um, we're, we're going to do a quick recap on what the first four webinars covered, um, and then we're going to look into how you tell the story. So you've done your theory of change, you've gathered up your data, what do you do with that data and tell your story? How do you put your story together? Um, what, and we're gonna share some practical tips and tools and then finish with how you can learn from your data. So the learning objectives for this webinar are to understand how you do um, data analysis and reporting and um, how you can look at both the qualitative and quantitative data. We'll talk about how you can report on data, also kind of looking at it as in a light touch way, how can you do it relatively efficiently and so it doesn't chew up all of your resources and, and you can actually do it. Um, and understanding approaches and considerations when learning from data. So a uh, recap on what we've talked about. Um, we've talked about for social enterprises, ventures, the importance of having both a business plan and an impact plan to create that sustainable impact that they all want to have. Um, and the part we're talking about here is of course the impact plan. And part of that impact management framework, one part is the theory of change, and we did a, um, a session on what a theory of change is and then how you can teach and facilitate theory of change. Uh, and then combining the theory of change with the indicators plus data collection methods to get the data that you need to um, tell your story of change in a compelling way. So the framework includes a plan for how the organisation will will collect, store and analyse that data on the indicators. We talked about choosing a good approach, um, identifying what the good thing is that you're trying to work towards and then working out what the logic is that joins the two, why it makes sense that if you throw the basketball in that way, it's going to end up in the hoop. Um, what's, what, is there any evidence that supports the approach that you want to take being the most effective? And we talked about how in most sectors there is clear research on certain interventions leading to certain outcomes. And so we suggested that that's a good starting point to think about what evidence is out there and then do your own research to learn what change you're having. And this was the simple theory of change that we used as an example where um, parents and children were, parents were participating in a parenting program um, so that they could grow their confidence, read to their children more, increase the cognitive development of the children, which would lead to children arriving at school ready to learn. And this is what it looks like. So um, some of you had a go, um, had a, did a workshop with a theory of change, um, sorry, a theory of change workshop with a venture um, and tried out that theory of change facilitation process and encouraging them to write down on post-it notes what changes. Uh, I'm sure it looked different in every place. It always does. Um, it usually goes through a messy phase where the social enterprises are throwing out everything that they're doing and then you kind of refine it and bring it back in together, um, maybe with some arrows. But th th this is an example of what it looks like getting towards that logic. We talked about what an indicator is. We had a, a session on measurement um, and how an indicator 
the example I used for that is the petrol gauge in a car that shows you that there's petrol in the car without you having to stick your head in the tank. Um, and so indicators are that clue that something's happening um, without being proof that it's certainly happened. If you can get proof, that's even better, but um, the level of rigor that social enterprises need generally at the, the stage that you're probably working with them at um, isn't so rigorous that they're kind of at the level of randomized control trials. And, and so an indicator being a clue that something's happened is good enough. We also talked about what makes a good indicator. So having it be valid, reliable, precise, measurable, timely, and relevant. So being measurable, it's quantifiable. You can use available tools and methods. It's reliable, it's, it's gonna be there over time. It's not something that you'd only see once and then um, next time you run that program, you wouldn't see that kind of change. Um, it's timely, you can, it provides a measurement at a time interval relevant and appropriate in, in terms of that program and, and those activities. And it's relevant, it's linked to the program or achieving the program's objectives. Um, we talked about using a lean data approach, being customer driven, using low cost technology and decision driven. So trying to find, find data that will help you make um, good decisions to work towards the impact that you want to have. And this was the flow. Um, first, identifying what impact you're trying to have, partnering with the community that you're hoping to work in, checking whether evidence exists of a good way to approach a challenge in that community to achieve the outcome that you want, and then developing and refining that theory of change. Then moving on to measures, so coming up with a measure for each of the priority outcomes within the theory of change or the golden thread, um, and then gathering data against those outcomes using the indicators. So um, after gathering the data, there's the storing, analyzing, and reporting, and that's some of what we're talking about in this session, and finally learning from that data and communicating it to stakeholders so that you can do all these fantastic things with your impact measurement and management. Um, you can use it to both prove and improve and communicate the impact of the organization. So we've, we've done all the work um, and now we're getting on to how can the organization use that data to prove what it's doing is working and to improve what it's, uh, the impact that it's having. So we've talked through the theory of change, we've looked at the indicators and data, now what we're gonna look at is analysis and reporting. So that starts with telling the story. Why do you want to tell the story? Um, telling your story allows you to demonstrate the impact that you're having. Often you'll be telling your story because it matters to someone, one of your stakeholders. Uh, it could be your staff, your beneficiary, um, your founder or someone else. It enables you to mobilize people to your vision. Um, having that data and insights means people are much more likely to get involved and support you than, um, than if you just had a plan or an idea of how you were going to have impact. So evidence proves that you're having that impact and that's really powerful. And actually collecting and analyzing data forces you to sit down and think about what you're doing. The process of collecting and analyzing the data can lead to insights on how, you're, how you can have more impact. So what is effective reporting? People want to hear more about the impact you're having and less about your organization. We suggest that you focus on telling the story of your impact through having the beneficiaries up front. You might want to achieve this through case studies or through data about the change you've helped create. Beneficiaries are at the center of what you do, so they should be at the center of your reporting as well. And also consider how um, you're being accountable to those beneficiaries and reporting so that they can understand it. We've talked about, we've talked through the whole program about focusing on outcomes rather than activities. It's okay to include some activities in your reporting, but make sure they're not the sole focus of your reporting. Really push to try and um, report on outcomes, even if you don't have a lot of data at the start on the outcomes. 
So if you can focus on outcomes, then you'll be well ahead of most other organisations. And on that point of um, try and push towards outcomes, even if you don't have a lot of data to start with, we're going to talk about minimum viable reporting. What's the, what's the equivalent to minimum viable product? You've probably heard that term. Um, it, we say, what's the best place to start with reporting? Often it's thinking about minimum viable reporting. What's the stuff you really need to focus on to meet your learning needs and the reporting needs of your funders and partners? but not go over the top. We've got some suggestions through this that we'll go through in the next slides. But before you go diving in and creating complex reports or overdoing things, just think about how you can start small and build from there. If you make reporting too complex, it will become a burden before people get an opportunity to identify the benefits. So identify your audience. There'll be lots of different audiences for your reporting, it could be your management, your board, the people that you're seeking to benefit, your funders or the media, and, and they'll have different needs. So the management and the report, sorry, the management and the board, they might want the more complex data. They might not need it that frequently, but they, sorry, the management will need it more frequently than the board, but um, they'll want the, both the, kind of robust data to show what change is happening, but they might also want some of the stories that are coming through so that they can feel more connected to the action and um, make decisions based on what's actually happening on the ground. Um, the people that you're seeking to benefit, they'll want to see what change looks like for them. So think about how you can report your impact in that way. Um, and the funders and the media, more likely the media will be wanting stories than the hard data and the funders might want a combination. It depends what kind of funders they are. Some funders have their own um, measures that they've asked you to collect data on and so you have to obviously um, respond to that. But it's useful we find also to push your funders to want to hear more outcomes data and um, more of the stories because that can help them get a clear understanding of what you're doing and hopefully bef become more invested in you as an organisation. I say you, I mean the ventures, the social enterprises. Any other thoughts as we go on, on the kinds of different reporting that you would do? Yeah, I was thinking about the, especially the difference between the kind of report you would do to the media versus the kind of report you would do to a funder. And I was thinking a lot of that then feeds backwards into your data collection methods. Mm -hmm. So for example, the media often want a real story. You know, they want somebody that they can go and talk to about the impact. Mm. So thinking about during your data collection methods, how are you getting permission for that or how are you building relationships so that you can later go back and say, hey, look, you know, the newspaper or this blog wants to talk to somebody who we've worked with, you know, are, are you willing to do that? Whereas a funder is probably much more interested in, in the aggregated story mm. rather than, um, they'll be less drawn to the individual stories of change perhaps, but still want to see that uh, human aspect of it. Mm, absolutely, good point. And it might even be that you want to think about taking photos um, mm. to support that media stuff later on with the right permissions. Yes. <laughs> um, think about your audience's needs. That's the next thing. What are they most interested in? What are they asking? Um, what are they asking for? So you've identified your audience, then think about what you want to convey to them. What will they be most interested in based on your understanding of their motivations? If you're asking them to make decisions such as funding you, then make sure they've got the evidence in the report that you're giving them to back up that request that you're making. Put yourselves in their shoes and think about what you'd want to know. Remember, you understand your organisation really well and sometimes it can be hard to tell the full story of your organisation. You have to imagine that you're new to the organisation when you're telling that story. Um, they might have no idea what you do. So, so you can think about your reporting in terms of the whole of the theory of change, not just the outcomes. It might be that you want to tell them about your activities, about who your stakeholder is, um, about what's changing early on and about what your long-term goal is and hopefully all those things together plus some evidence will tell the full picture of change. 
rather than just the headline of we gave out this many lunches to kids who needed it. Um, so here are some key principles that you can consider when you're doing your impact reporting. Be clear. The reader can quickly and easily understand the organisation through a coherent narrative that connects the aims you've got with your plans, your activities and results. So make sure that you're using that opportunity well to be as clear as possible. Uh, make sure it's accessible. Think about how you can use relevant information um, that's useful and, and clear, plain language for whoever's going to be reading it. Um, use a range of formats suitable for the different stakeholders. So for your board, maybe it's text heavy and they can just consume all of that information quickly in a, a few paragraphs, um, but make it visually accessible and interesting for other audiences who you want to be really engaged. And in some contexts, it might not even be a document, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're working with people who don't have high levels of literacy, say, mm -hmm. it might be as simple as just going back and telling the stories yeah. that you heard. Yeah, definitely. People. Or a video or mm -hmm. all sorts of different formats. Um, be transparent. Reporting is full, open and honest and try and hold yourselves to account Certainly, um, that normally organisations are good at doing that to their funders, but um, some of the organisations we really like hold themselves to account to the communities that they're seeking to benefit. They see them as their, effectively their shareholders and they make sure that they are reporting to them as though they are their shareholders. Um, accountability. So reporting connects with stakeholders. Make sure that your reporting connects with the stakeholders, partners and beneficiaries to tell them what they need to know and provide that reassurance. It's verifiable. Um, it, you're not just making claims that can't be backed up. Um, you've, you've got the information in there that people need to be able to um, appreciate the work that you've done um, and kind of act as external auditors. Um, and that feels like one that's always going to be quite context dependent, isn't it? The bigger the claim you're making, um, or the more the more innovative you're being potentially as well, the more likely people are going to want to see evidence. If you're yeah. if you're doing the same thing that has been done for years and years, then maybe people you know want, want less of that. But yeah, having being able to back it up even then mm -hmm. is important. Yeah, and finally proportionality. Oh. Oh, that's what you're Sorry, saying. Sorry, yeah. No, I, I jumped, I jumped yeah. ahead for ourselves without realising. <laughs> um, so lessons learned. Um, demonstrating that you're reflecting on what you've learned can be great for building credibility. People value the fact that you're being open and honest and this will increase trust. Um, for example, one of the social enterprises we work with created a, a whole separate blog post about the things they'd learnt. Um, and when the projects were run by the community, they were far more successful. So they, they told that story um, than when the social enterprise was running them. So they were kind of quite open and, and said, yeah, that's, it wasn't us, it was them that was having the most impact. Yeah. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, so it's an organisation that works with ethical supply chains and, and they were running lots of local uh, initiatives like um, getting um, people, you know, young people, especially girls, into schools. They were looking at, um, you know, ethical uh, factory conditions, those sorts of things. And their initial approach was very much sort of driven by the company mm -hmm. and and controlled by the company. But actually, they found the more they let go of that project, the more successful it became because the local ownership became so much stronger. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of the reflections that they said. Look, you know, we didn't get it right the first time, but We've now learned from that and when we do it in the future, this is how we're going to do it. Cool. Okay, so we've sort of run through why you tell the story and some tips on how to do that. Now we're going to look at pulling that story together. Um, first, we'll just highlight why, what you're trying to pull out before we go into how you pull the stuff out of your data. I think that's helpful to know what you're looking for at the start. Um, so these are a few of the things that we often see organisations pulling out of their data when they're doing the number crunching. Um, so one of the first things there is what I like um, 
the most significant change. It's, it's quite a good approach to think about um, extracting those really valuable stories at the start. So it, it's got two purposes. Firstly, it's great for reporting in fun, to funders and stakeholders, and it creates a compelling story about the impact that you're having. And secondly, if you identify situations of the most significant change, this can give insights into where your program is most effective or what other factors can lead to success. So basically it's saying, look through all of the data and pull out the stories that are really significant for the stakeholder. So um, is it that you're um, improving well-being for a lot of people, but for someone, they've got a story of how it actually saved their life. Like that story is just miles above the impact of all of the other ones. Doesn't mean you're not going to tell any of the story of change for those other things, but you really want to pull out those headliners um, to tell the story of how, what the maximum impact is that you're occasionally having. Um, another thing you want to look out for is trends. So um, we'll talk about how you can analyze the data to look, to look for those, but basically you're looking for um, trend changes in certain populations or links between a particular activity and a particular outcome or one outcome and another outcome often being correlated. So um, not necessarily causation, but are you seeing that this one and this one often happen together? Um, and are there things in there that you didn't expect? Are there trends that are surprising? Um, and then of course you also have to capture things that relate to specific donor requirements. So if they've said, look, we really need you to tell us about gender diversity, then that's obviously something that you'll pull out. Um, and concentrate on anything that links to your theory of change. So focus on your priority outcomes first, the one in your theory of change, and look for what's happening within those outcomes um, and whether any of the other things can link into those outcomes, even if it hadn't been related to a specific indicator that you thought would tell you about that outcome. So look for other clues that can tell you about changes within that outcome. Okay, so, so now you're into your data, the fun part. Um, most people don't find it fun looking at a spreadsheet, but um, that's where we've got to of doing all of this work to get to the point where you've got a bunch of a bunch of data that just needs a bit of work before it can be useful for storytelling. So first step is to clean your data. So gather it all up. You might have a bunch of paper surveys, or you might have some rough notes of when you've interviewed people. Um, you might have videoed people, and that. That, that video you need to turn into writing so that you can compare it against all of the other stuff. So first capture it all in one place and often organizations use Excel. So write it down in the lines in Excel and then clean it. So um, think about which data needs to be collated and which doesn't. Um, think about all of the different data sources you have. Do you need to pull in um, a government data set that you'd been using as an indicator and you have to make sure you've got that included in the spreadsheet at the same time. Um, and then collate and normalize the data so that you can group or connect, or connect it to each other. And part of that, a point that I needed to make is going through and checking that the language is the same within it so that when you do any analysis on it, it works right. So it might be that you'd asked everyone, do they like dogs or cats? And um, three people wrote that they liked dogs, three people liked that, wrote that they liked cats, and two people wrote that they liked dog. Um, if you go through that, it's not going to tell you, it's not going to group dogs and dog together. You've got to check that that language is right. This is probably obvious to everyone, but um, oh, that definitely it's the first place to start is to go through and check that the language is all right and clean, clean up that data. Check that there's no missing, but missing cells or rows that, um, might make your data think that it's at the end of a thing that it needs to sort because there's a big gap in there when actually you've got some great data sitting underneath it, all of those sorts of things. But really, um, what you need to do is think about whether you can find an Excel expert or data analyst to get the best results. So um, you might be that person um, or the venture, the social enterprise might have that capacity in-house. They might be able to have a go themselves, but there seem to often be Excel experts floating around. 
often people know one. Um, so if you can ask them to spend an hour um, having a play with your data, that probably would be really valuable. There are also platforms, uh, volunteering platforms that you can check out online. Um, we've got links to some of them um, in the handout for this workshop where you can go and find data experts or people who can help you with some of this stuff. Um, so yeah, have, have a look around online as well. Um, if you happen to be one of those experts or you're learning how to use Excel, um, we think pivot tables are a good tool within Excel to help you focus the information. Um, and on the next slide, we've got a, a picture of what pivot tables look like. So they're just, they're part of Excel and they let you sort data. So here we've got um, a bunch of countries, a bunch of foods, um, and what we're able to see is that grand total along the bottom. So we can see not only the grand total in the bottom right of, of comparing all of those countries who like all of those vegetables, but we can, we can see that um, in the broccoli column, we know, we know which, which food is most interesting, the bananas, obviously. Um, is it bananas? No, beans. One of them. Um, but we can also see which country um, likes that thing the most. I'm making it up because I don't know this data properly. But you can see that you can use, you can analyze the data in different directions. It's not just about looking at Australia under the bananas. Mm. We can also see some holes in this data, which I think is quite useful as well. So yeah, yeah. we can see actually, well, the people in Canada must eat some beans. So we're missing, we're missing something here. Yeah. So actually we need to go back and probably one of those problems you highlighted earlier uh, might be causing this. Uh, so yeah, it can help you check for errors as well. And see if there's, the, this is really helpful for trends. So you can see if one of them's a standout, um, if, cause they're, it's all in one place, a lot of the stuff that you're trying to look at. Um, and what's better than Excel, Airtable. Chris, do you want to tell us about Airtable? Yes, yeah, so Airtable is an online platform and we've got a link in the, in the handout to find out a bit more about it. But it's an online platform that allows you to collaborate a bit more easily and also has some built-in things like it's got a built-in survey tool and built-in um, tools for doing analysis and graphing and, and things like that. So um, the, the basic version is free, which is great for social enterprises um, and it's not super expensive if they need to access some of the advanced elements. Uh, but what we found internally anyway is that when you're dealing with lots of different types of data, it's really useful. Uh, platforms like Excel deal really well with numbers, but don't deal so well once you get into uh, more uh, structured data like uh, regions or addresses or um, you know demographic characteristics. So it makes it super easy to group and filter um, all of those elements as well. So we recommend you you check it out, um, sign yourself up for a free version, and then you can um, play around with it with some of your ventures or, or recommend it to them. Great. Uh, so that's the quantitative data. It's hard to remember sometimes what the difference between quantitative and qualitative is. Qualitative has, I try and remember it by, it's got quality in there, and I think stories are more quality than num a bunch of numbers. So that's how I, <laughs> I try and remember, but it's tricky sometimes. Anyway, we've talked about the quantitative data, which is the numbers stuff. And now we're talking about the quality, interpreting the qualitative data, which is more of the stories. So that's um, often where you've asked a survey question that's a bit more open-ended. Um, and the data that you've got in isn't on a scale of one to five. It's, um, telling you about how someone felt about something or why they like to program or things like that. Um, so analyzing qualitative data can be time consuming because you have to manually read everyone's response, but there are often really great insights in this data. So um, if you've got the time, it's very valuable. So we're going to mention um, the difference between a deductive and an inductive approach. The deductive approach um, involves analysing the data based on a theory or a hypothesis that you've predetermined. In this case, you can use your questions as a guide for grouping and analysing your data. It's quick and easy um, 
for qualitative data and can be used when the researcher has an idea of the likely responses from your sample population. So you could use your theory of change for that. If you've got a bunch of open-ended things, but you had a theory, your, your theory of change is your hypothesis, and your theory of change said, as a result of this activity, we think that people will have improved confidence, um, improved accessibility, um, and improved nutrition. You can go through and list or go through and you've got all of the free text responses in your Excel and alongside each one you can say this one's about confidence, accessibility or nutrition and you just code them like that. Um, you, the theory of change is really useful as a starting point for that. Um, and then it allows you to sort and say, okay, well, 50% of the respondents said that the outcome that was most important to them was accessibility. It wasn't that confidence one, or it might be the other way around. Um, or the inductive approach. That's, uh, it's not based on a structured or predetermined pre framework. It's more um, thorough and time consuming, but it's often used when the researcher knows very little about the research that they're looking at. So as you go through the data, you'll begin to notice patterns and generate insights, and these insights form the structure of your analysis. So it's a bit more emergent. Um, so as you're doing the qualitative analysis, think about how you split the workload. Rather than splitting it up, the complete responses, consider analyzing each question um, assigning each question to a person. So it might be that there were five questions and, and you've got a bunch of researchers doing this analysis. So ask researcher one to look at all of the question one responses, um, depending on the circumstances. Other times it might be better for researcher one to look at answers one to five of that person so that they can get a full understanding of the change that that person experienced. Just it's um, dependent on the kind of research that you're doing and how you think you're going to best understand what change looks like. Cool, so just a couple more points on the interpreting qualitative data. The simplest way we think to identify impact is to have a document where you're consistently capturing quotes about impact. Um, this is, whether they come up from formal evaluation in your surveys or not, um, we sometimes tell social enterprises who have no resources at all, um, but we've worked with them to do a theory of change. We say, like, just go on your computer, or even if you don't have a computer, just have a book um, that has, like, the priority outcomes each outcome written down at the top of a page or in a separate Word document. And every time you hear those anecdotes or those stories come in, think about which outcome it mostly relates to and write the story down under that outcome. It's, it's tragic that so many of these organizations do fantastic things, but they don't gather any of those insights. And then it gets to the end of the year or, or a funding opportunity, and they're trying to scratch their heads thinking about what change happened. So, even if they've got no nothing, no capacity to um, gather data and report their impact, at least capturing those insights under those headings, um, they can then at the end go through and maybe at that point they can try and group those outcomes, um, those stories by outcomes and, and tell a bit of change. Um, so that's the, the cheapest, simplest way to do it. Um, if you think you know ahead of time what the topics might be, like you've got your theory of change, you can do that. Um, but otherwise you can review as you go. So, so if they're doing that technique, it might be that every six months they want to have a read through and effectively develop their hypothesis theory of change as they go. Um, and then once they've grouped those responses, they can analyze them on, based on the ones that have the most comments. So you find a lot of people saying that they're spending more time with their kids, well, this is quantitative data, you, you can still spot trends. This is qualitative data, sorry. You can still spot trends um, and even create numer numerical analysis on the basis of that data. Um, and then you can use Excel to record your coding process and then use it for data analysis. So that bit of going through and putting an extra column and saying, this one's about confidence, this one's about um, nutrition, then your next column over is saying it might have a scale of 
um, the, the, they're saying that this was really important to them, or they're saying that this was more important than something. So as a researcher, you might be able to extract some information out of that about like whether the change for that person was small, medium, or significant. And there's another quantitative data point that you've got. Any other thoughts on um, qualitative data or quantitative data that we want to share? No, I think it's just about diving into it, isn't it? And yeah. getting, getting kind of stuck into it and that immersion is what generates the insights mm -hmm. once you can see it all together. Yeah, and start with the most significant change because that's exciting, like go looking for the good stuff. Um, record those stories as you go and then you can get into more of the analysis stuff to draw out the trends that give you the kind of more robust data point to give to, to audiences that need that stuff. Yeah. Cool. Um, so thinking about format, there are different ways that you can um, report your impact. As we mentioned earlier, you can, you can just go and tell them the story. Um, you can put it in a presentation or a slide deck. Maybe you do that for your more corporate audiences. Um, you can have a written report for literate audiences um, that could be pu published online in an interactive web page or you could do a video. So um, there are some really cool videos that we see organisations do to, to come kind of full circle. So we say, okay, well, the organisation is doing great stuff. You're developing a theory of change of how change is happening because of that great stuff. And in that process, you've heard some of the stories of the stakeholders to understand what changes for them. You're turning those stories into indicators and data, collecting the data, putting it in an Excel spreadsheet, analysing the data so that you can understand what the most significant change is and how change is happening. And then you get right to the end and you say, okay, and now we want to communicate that impact back to our stakeholders. We'll pick one story that represents the biggest change that we were hearing about, because now we know where the change is mostly happening and we know which story to select that best represents that change and we'll use that story to tell the whole, whole, whole change. And it seems a little bit like, well, but couldn't we have just started with the story at the start? But you don't know which story to start with at the start. So um, talking about all of this data doesn't change our minds about the value of a good story and um, telling someone's personal journey. Yeah. Um, Abigail's just shared that what she likes to do is share snapshots of data with entrepreneurs in the Facebook group so they can see the combined results of their data. Yeah, great. And then that, that helps the people who are, you know, they're, which is, you know, if they're us, if they're filling in the survey, they're actually seeing that full loop from the effort that they've made to, to do that survey to actually the insights that it generates. So that's really cool. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Abigail. Any other thoughts as we go? Fire them through. Yeah, and um, uh, for the, the other question about videos, um, we've got some links in this presentation, but we can um, potentially track down a few other videos um, and uh, pop those in the Slack group mm -hmm. um, as well. Cool. Um, so we've just got some key components there in case that's useful of um, a, a suggested structure to pull in to, for pulling together a report. It doesn't need to be in that order, but in case that's helpful, often they've got an executive summary, tell the story in a really punchy way up the top so that um, it catches their attention quickly and for people with um, a short attention span, They've got the key part, um, and then you can describe the activities, the outcomes, the impact stories, and then visualize it in a compelling way. You'll notice that the components there of the report aren't incredibly dissimilar from your theory of change. So you already know the activities and the outcomes because you've done the theory of change. The impact stories are um, the stories that are about the golden thread or the um, data that you've had coming out and then we'll go on to talk about data visualization now. Um, oh, and also just to note that organizations often combine the impact report with the annual report just so you know how it kind of fits in. Um, so data visualization, try to tell your story visually. Um, it, this can be really useful for um, we don't want to underestimate the value of um, the visual component of the storytelling. Words are useful, but if you can put it in a way that 
tells a story through how it's represented, it's much more compelling. This one here, I think is so cool. It's, it's um, showing where most of the energy is kind of happening around the, the bigger circles. Um, so at its most basic, you could use graphs and diagrams um, to help people interpret the information, which is still better than just a, a sentence written on a page. Um, but there are some um, interesting tools out there that can help you visualize things in a more interesting way. Um, there's a whole website called Viz for Social Good, and we've put a link in that in the handout as well, and that can connect you with volunteers who can help you with data visualization. So a lot of other people that get just as excited as we do about visualizing data. Um, so I've got a couple of examples there. This one, there used sausages and eggs to visualize. It's a really interesting data visualization. So each of the plates um, is representative of a location in the European Union and the bigger the size, the bigger the number of people. And they filled the dish with food associated with that location. So obviously it's less precise, um, but it's far more interesting. And that means people are more likely to engage with it and share it um, and probably remember it as well. And then here's one from New Zealand, um, which unfortunately is very um, compelling. So this is, uh, this is talk talking about the story of inequality in New Zealand. And we've got a lot of people crammed in there to the bottom quarter of the bottom floor, um, just showing that the poorest 50% of New Zealanders own only 2% of the wealth in the country. And you can see that guy on the top floor just on his penthouse, two, two and a half story penthouse, loving life. And then we've got people um, sitting actually outside the building who are experiencing homelessness. So um, it's a pretty compelling way, we think, to represent what inequality is looking like. Um, also experiment with video. There are lots of, as we mentioned, video tools that um, are free and they'll do little things like have pre-populated icons that can move around and you can change the icons and do a voiceover on it and write in your own text. Um, so that people sort of have a short attention span but engage with video more than reading something. So um, if you can get good at publishing things using video, that's probably a great skill to have. Um, so we just thought we'd quickly share with you some common themes of tricky things that often come up. The first thing is um, how you deal with patchy data. And that's um, so where you've kind of been getting responses in, but they've only been responding on a couple of the outcomes or um, you haven't got data for every participant in the program that makes it hard for you to give um, quantifiable responses. So, you, so you, responses with a, a quantity or a percentage. So you can't say 60% of respondents said they, re they really liked the um, non-plastic cutlery that we gave them. Um, what you can do in that instance is say, um, 20 people said they really liked this. So it's not as robust, obviously, it's um, you're working with what you've got, but just because you haven't got the response from everyone doesn't mean that's not still interesting. So saying 20 people found it really good, that blah, blah, that's still 20 people more that we know about than what we did before. Um, and the other thing there of what do you do when you don't have any long-term data yet? So for both of these, the theory of change is really useful. Um, if you've got data on the short-term outcomes, combining that data with the compelling nature of your theory of change and the evidence that you might have drawn from external, res external sources to say that, hey, it makes sense that if parents increase their parenting skills and confidence um, and then they start reading to their kids more, their kids' cognitive development is going to increase we don't actually need to test the kids' cognitive development. Um, we can just rely on the evidence that said reason that says reading to children leads to increased cognitive development. And then we combine that with the data we've got showing that the parents are reading to their children more. And then that looks like a full compelling story of change. 
And that's the same with, with the patchy data. Sometimes you might have data on the first outcome, not the second outcome, but the third outcome. And, and that's because that second outcome might just be really hard stuff to measure. Um, that's okay as well. You can say, look, um, we're, um, we're seeing that the parents are more confident. They're talking about their parenting practice at home a lot more, which suggests to us that because they're sharing it, they're more confident. And the teachers at school, the kindergarten, are, showing, are, are saying that the kids are testing really well on the cognitive development. We don't actually have to ask the parents about how many hours they're reading to their kids um, because that's kind of an imposition on the parents and we don't want to put the shame factor on them and have, the, have them answer. We're seeing results on both ends. We're, we're confident that the one in the middle is happening. Great. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I was just thinking through um, how, again, it comes back to transparency often too, doesn't it, and, and accountability. So you, you might find, you know, I've seen this happen before where a venture creates a survey and asks the question mm -hmm. and then they get the response back and realise that people were answering a completely different question than they thought they were asking. So actually just recognising that and saying, look, you know, we don't have data for this one because, but we've learned Mm -hmm. that we need to ask the question differently or we need to ask that question face to face because it's really hard for people to convey it in an anonymous way or yeah you know, and, and remember that um what we're talking about here is data gathering and measurement that's light touch cheap um it's not trying to be as robust as a randomized control trial as i said it's um data capture that's designed to give you quick insights so that you can learn whether what you're doing is working or not and to quickly share with stakeholders whether it's working or not. Um, so be a bit pragmatic mm. and be comfortable with it not being perfect um, and be willing to communicate how perfect it is or isn't. Um, the, the, one of the principles of social return on investment is um, false rigor and, and Nothing undermines your credibility more than overclaiming something and then it being obvious or someone finding out. So it's much better to say, look, this is this is the data we've got. This is yeah. um, as much as we've got and we're sharing it all with you. Yeah. Nice. So there are a couple of um, platforms that are quite useful for doing data analysis and telling the story as well. So we thought we'd touch on these. Uh, generally, our experience has been that most social enterprises can't afford for these platforms, but we thought it was important to at least mention them and highlight them to you because you may have organizations that can afford them. Um, and so what's interesting about these is that they tend to take quite a, a, a complete approach to the, the process, a kind of end to end. So they'll help you run surveys, they'll, help, they'll, they'll import data from lots of different places, they'll be connected to the government data sets and you know, establish uh, indicator sets like the um, IRS, the, the impact investment uh, data sets or the UN um, de development goals. So they, they make it a lot easier in that they bring things together for you um, and then they help you do the data and analysis. So for example, Social Cops, one of these allows you to do geographic analysis, which obviously is not something you can do in Excel. So you could ask it questions like, um, show me all of the uh, villages that have uh, poor maternal health but great road access so that you can think, okay, well, how do we then access those people uh, in a really cost-effective manner? So um, really great for creating that extra level of analysis if organizations can afford them. Um, and, and all of these are, are linked in the handout, so you can go and have a look at them for yourself. Um, but they, again, you know, there's a level of commitment that small organizations are going to struggle to make both financially and in terms of time, as opposed to just sort of cobbling together uh, what they have, but worth, worth looking at so that you're at least aware of them, so that when you come across organizations that might want to use them, you can direct them in the right direction. Great. Um, okay, so we, we've talked through why, why you should bother telling the story, um, how you can pull the story together and analyze the data to pull out those insights that you want to tell and different formats for how you can um, represent that data and tell your story in a compelling way. Now we're going to cover off how you can learn from your data. Um, that's, that's an important part of it, 
all the way through these uh, webinars, we've talked about how impact is about proving and improving what you do. So the data analysis and storytelling is about proving what you're doing, but don't forget the importance of the improving part and making sure that you're using that data to make decisions to um, increase your impact. And we sometimes call that managing to outcomes or outcomes management. Um, it's making decisions, managing your organization towards the impact that you want to have. So from data to knowledge, what does it look like? Um, if you've just got data, that can be a red light, a traffic light. Um, that's telling you a piece of information, that traffic light. Um, so moving up to the information, that, that red light is telling you, the red light, it's a red traffic light and I'm in a car. The knowledge is um, that the traffic light is telling me I should stop. And the wisdom is knowing that if I don't stop, I'll probably end up in a car accident and that's bad for me. So what we're talking about here is moving, that, moving your data from data up to wisdom, not just so that you can tell the story, but so that you can um, use it to make informed decisions. And another example, Chris? Yeah, so we thought we'd try and give a, an, an impact example here. So we might have a piece of data that comes in that tells us that infant mortality in a rural region is 10%. And that might be higher um, than we expect. So that's where we start to think about information level. We, we might make some comparative examples. And we also know that we've been using male nurses in our project, let's say, for maternal support. And as we build up to the next level, we, we know that on, based on past experience, if we change the gender of the nurses, that that has a positive effect. And we may not understand exactly why that positive effect has happened, but we can at least look at those two different uh, sets of information and compare them. Because at the next level of wisdom, we might start to reflect on this and interpret it and think, well, actually, based on our assumptions or based on our experience, uh, we found that women are more open and honest about their pregnancy with female nurses. So now we know if we want to be more effective in our program, we need to make a change to our program. So just looking at the data alone, wouldn't it, we would never have got there. We had to go through this process of thinking through uh, and, and actually doing the interpretation. Now, obviously, in practice, you don't sit down and step through each of that. But what we wanted to do was break down those different layers to highlight for you how you get to that level of insight and, and development. Cool. Um, so your theory of change is your hypothesis that you're trying to test whether it's right or wrong um, and use your data to track your progress throughout that theory of change. A super simple way that sometimes we represent that is um, to sit in behind your theory of change a traffic light system. So for the outcomes that you're collecting data on, um, change the background color to um, green, orange, or red, depending on what the data is telling you about whether you're achieving that outcome or not. It's just quite a, a simple tip on a visualization that can help you um, track your progress. One of the things we were talking about before as well was that maybe you might still be only measuring your short-term outcomes or your medium-term outcomes, but if you're starting to see oranges or reds in those areas, then you know that it's unlikely or less likely that your long-term outcomes are going to be coming uh, the way you expected them. Yeah. This also can be useful for sharing with other stakeholders like your, um, your board. They might want to see how you're tracking against that theory of change. Okay, so acting on the data. Based on your insights, you'll have a whole lot of new ideas to explore. Think about creating a list of those as you do your analysis. Um, you might just have things emerge that are like, well, that's, that doesn't seem right, doesn't seem like what we expected. We want to go back to that later. Don't save all those thoughts up to the end because you'll forget them, write them down. <laughs> so you might like to create a document or a spreadsheet with meaningful headings to store them under as well. So you need a system to prioritize and test those ideas. You could use lots of different criteria. Here was suggested cost, evidence, and the speed um, as criteria that you could use. It's good to think about how you could use these criteria to rank and select your ideas as well. What would you do as your next steps after creating that marked list? So that ranked list, sorry. 
So the, some of the things you might want to think about are um, which ones are most related to the priority outcomes that lead into the impact that we want to see. Or are there some hidden negative outcomes within there that we hadn't anticipated before and we need to really check those negative outcomes to make sure that we're not doing harm. Um, we think that um, organisations we've seen that do this really well, do the outcomes management really well, they have really frequent analysis of the data. So actually in their fortnightly meetings, they've got the data out on the table in front of them and they're using that data to analyse how they're going. It's not just kind of number of customers that came in the shop. So they're really proactively using that data and they are cultivating a learning culture. And some of the ones I've spoken to that are doing that, there aren't that many, um, but ones I've spoken to that are doing that, they've got um, hugely increased staff and volunteer engagement. People are really invested in the outcomes and so it's benefiting the organisation financially to do that because they've got more buy-in from staff and, and volunteers. So just a little aside as a selling pitch for why to do this stuff. Okay, so data driven versus data informed. Um, step one to doing this is having the data. Step two is how you use that data effectively. For example, giving away free shoes to thousands of people, data driven means that you would count that as a success. But your qualitative interviews might show that the shoes aren't actually leading to more kids going to school. So data informed would mean that you rank the data, but also place it in the context of your insights that are generated from multiple continuous sources. You should also be constantly sense checking your data. Does one of your indicators seem to be performing strangely or making a big change that you can't explain? If so, dive into that indicator a bit more, that one indicator. Um, and think about whether you asked a survey question in a way that causes confusion or um, is one of your data collection methods faulty or is it actually that that is alarming and there's something wrong and you need to change your program. Um, but just also remember that many indicators take time to change and to collect. So you might only be surveying people once a year but your teams might be on the ground noticing changes more quickly. So they may notice a specific intervention working better than another or a short-term outcome happening but medium outcomes aren't. So sometimes analysing your data can give you some niggling thought that something isn't right. If you share that with your staff, um, they could give you insights that back that up or, or negate that more quickly than what you can get yourself through a survey. Okay, so being data informed, focus on the behaviour. Um, try to understand what behaviour or situation is leading to that indicator. That's really critical to interpreting the data. Is it misleading? Could your indicator be telling you something different from what you intended? Uh, are you measuring a proxy indicator that isn't a good proxy anymore? For example, you might be measuring material, um, maternal hospital visits, thinking that they were for pregnancy when they might actually be for something else. Um, also think about the context. Has something outside your program changed? Uh, are there additional atmospheric pollution that you, um, so you measure the indoor pollution, which has a different baseline. And also data versus intuition. I like this idea that you, you might just have a gut feel. How does that fit in with what the data is telling you? Um, so when interpreting your impact and the indicators that show it, you've got two choices. You can rely purely on the data and things that the data can prove but in some contexts, like for example in medicine, um, this is going to, and in the medicine field that is going to be the best approach because you've got kind of good research that says, look, we know what change looks like to um, end a disease and we can track progress against that. But um, in other contexts, you might want to use your intuition a little bit more. Um, you might want to cross-reference with... Um, your own life experience, particularly in com com um, complex situations. Um, 
you, you might want to draw in your own personal or organisation values. For example, often you'll reach a better decision using a combination of data and intuition um, where there's a number of factors to consider. So the more experience you have or the more accurate your intuition will be, such as 10 years in the recommended field, um, or unstructured decisions without clear cause or effect, they sometimes benefit from intuition um, than the more structured decisions such as medical diagnosis. Also think about the time um, as a consideration. Quick decisions benefit from more intuition than decisions where you can take more time for analysis. So um, if you're needing to make those quick decisions, how can you use the data that you have got but not rely on the best data and then combine that with your intuition to make a good decision. Have you got any examples, Chris, of when intuition is a useful tool? Yeah, I think often when you've got groups of people who've, who've come together and have a diverse set of experience, that often makes a really big difference. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's a lot of risk in just being an individual and going, oh, well, you know, that's what the data says, but I, I believe or, or, or I, my, my prejudice is that, that we should do this thing. Um, so it, it's not so much about values based as being, you know, intuitive and, and taking the sum of your experience or the group ideally of mm -hmm. experience um, and testing it against each other. Mm. Okay, so be wary of algorithms. Um, algorithms can be great and I'm sure with machine learning we're about to have our world completely turned around and using algorithms. Um, but you might be tempted to develop tech solutions that automatically analyse your data for you. But, um, and, and that is becoming more feasible with low cost online tools. But algorithms can have risks as well. They can sometimes mistake correlation for causation. It can also be hard to trace the process that an algorithm has taken. Um, and sometimes there's algorithms that are unhelpful. So some algorithms build in bias that exists within the world, in the internet, in the criminal justice system, um, like racism and sexism and um, all kinds of other biases that you need to be careful to um, keep out of your own data analysis. Yeah. Any other thoughts of that when algorithms? Yeah, well, I think the one, the one you mentioned is, is quite famous, the, the just criminal justice system in the, in the US. So they use a, uh, or they have used a platform that um, basically tells judges how much time or how much of a prison sentence they should give people. Um, but the problem of, of that is that it took into account um, racial factors, demographic factors, geographical factors. So actually, what it ended up doing was just reinforcing the prejudices against um, against equality, equality approaches, effectively, and mm -hmm. saying, "Well, because you come from a certain part of the city, you're more likely to reoffend." Which is this, you know, what you refer to as, you know, correlation versus causation. Just because you're born somewhere doesn't mean you're going to behave in a certain way. Um, and, and another example about the unpredictability of these things. There's an algorithm that Facebook uses. Uh, actually an artificial intelligence algorithm where actually they they programmed this system but they actually don't know how it works they can't unpick it it kind of built itself and it creates great results for facebook but they can't tell you how mm -hmm. all they know is that they put stuff in and other stuff comes out and that's becoming more and more common with a lot of these machine learning platforms um this uh, people are saying there's a role for the social sector to make sure that um, algorithms that is designed outside of the social sector are fair. Um, and so maybe in your own context, you will be developing insights through your data collection and evidence generation that um, can be shared with machine learners to um, teach a least biased approach. Okay, learning culture values. Um, a learning culture considers three key aspects. It encourages an honest, honest assessment of what's being achieved so far. 
It also requires an openness to disagreeing with a popular opinion. Um, this might be internal opinions or external opinions. Sometimes it's useful to just put, a, put on a different hat and think about a problem from a different angle. And finally, having a learning culture requires you to be open to constructive feedback, being open to hearing about other people's views and critical to reviewing your own work. Um, it's, it's, it's really useful though when organisations do create the culture where um, they're learning as they go, they are values based and not just paying lip service to that, they're really committed to the impact that they're trying to see. And it can be quite exciting for organisations too. It becomes sort of like they've gamified it, um, trying to tweak around the edges and change their approach to achieve maximum impact for the people that they're seeking to benefit. So um, you can have fun with it too. Learning cultures promote intelligent risk taking and making dis difficult decisions based on evidence. If you've got that effective learning culture, it, you can um, make intelligent risks because you've got the information and information sitting behind it so that it's not completely out there. Um, it might, set, might have seemed like a, a crazy idea before you had the evidence, but now that you've got that evidence, it, it seems like a sensible idea. Um, and also that's the case for making sensible, um, difficult decisions. It might be that you're doing a whole lot of stuff, but the data is telling you actually program X, Y, or Z isn't contributing that much towards the outcomes, but it's draining a lot of your resources and time. Uh, so it can help you to not pursue that activity and focus your efforts on the ones that are really creating the impact. Change management. So impact reporting isn't just some static document you create to send out to funders. It's a living document that helps you understand what's working and what isn't working. And you need to take that learning approach to impact reporting so that it doesn't just become a business process that people resent. Um, it, if people don't see the value of what you've created from gathering that data, from analysing it and reporting it, then it becomes a chore that people will avoid. So to the extent that you can build it into your processes, build it into your meetings, your change, your, your thinking about how you're progressing as an organisation, your storytelling, um, gamify it if you need to, um, but do all of those things to really get the most value out of the work you've done, developing a theory of change, gathering the data and analysing that data. So that's it, that's the full journey. That's, um, you've come right around to learning from the data and communicating the data. It's um, been a, a fun journey for us, taking you through this cycle and um, all five webinars, starting with why think about impact through to learning about the theory of change and teaching that theory of change and facilitating a workshop. Um, through to gathering, identifying indicators, gathering the data and storing, analysing and reporting it so you can learn and communicate that impact. Um, congratulations for sticking with us this long and um, thanks. So just some final comments. Um, the upcoming seminar doesn't have any homework. Um, we're just keeping it open for you to ask questions and discuss next steps and if you um, need any one-on-one -on -one support. Do you have any more comments on that? No, I think we're, we'll, um, it was great to see a great turnout this week. Um, not all of the themes have had consistent turnout, so we wanted to wait and see how many people we had coming through, but um, just wanted to yeah, encourage people to come along to that seminar because it's the opportunity to shape up the final stage so the the webinars were i guess like a really they were a really big chunk of what we're delivering here but then there is um some flexibility that we can provide other support um after the webinars either one-on-one -on -one or in small groups or, or something like that so it's really an opportunity to uh, for that session to uh, touch base with everybody again and get a sense of where people are at in their learning are there things that people want us to go back over again um, now that you've got to the end of the journey um, are there other things that you wanted to to talk about as a group? Are there other ways you want to connect um, as a as a group, as a cohort yourselves? Um, 
yeah, so um, that's uh, locked in your calendars uh, and we encourage you. And if there are other people from your organization, then they, sh they should attend as well. Um, but uh, specifically, we wanted to thank DFAT and Frontier Incubators um, as well for funding this program and being great partners on this. Um, and there's a whole lot of people who you haven't seen on the webinars um, behind the scenes um, who've been working at Arkina to help develop all of this content as well. So um, thank you to Nicola and Guy and Karina um, who've also been part of that. And thank you, Clemmy, for doing the bulk of the work of uh, fronting all these webinars. And thank you, Chris, for the bulk of the work of bringing the slides together. My pleasure. So thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. Over and out. All right, we'll uh, see you at the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to see you guys. You too. You too. See ya.